Larry Schiller is here as a part of our exhibition, uh, American Visionary, uh, John F. Kennedy's Life and Times, which Larry was the curator. Uh, and we are uh, thrilled to have him give us his insights about pulling together that exhibition as well as stories uh, from his very, very rich um, and uh, exciting and interesting life. Uh, and I will share a little bit of that with you uh, in a moment. Uh, first, however, I want to thank um, our sponsors um, who helped make the exhibition and our educational programming, such as Larry's talk today, possible. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank our lead sponsor, the McIntyre Foundation, um, which works tirelessly um, behind the scenes to uh, enrich the cultural life of this community. Um, they were joined uh, by Diamond V and Little Drugstore Products, uh, both donor-advised uh, funds of the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation, and my thanks to them. And my thanks to our members and to our contributors to the annual fund. It is through your support um, that we are able to do the world-class kind of exhibitions like American Visionary uh, and the uh, company exhibition uh, educational programming um, that we are able to do. Uh, so thank you all uh, for your help in making sure that the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art uh, is, is strong um, and is able to bring the kind of programming um, that you want. Larry Schiller was born in 1936 in Brooklyn. Uh, his first camera, uh, he got a hold of his first camera while in junior high school in San Diego. Um, but by the time he was at Pepperdine College, um, he was already submitting and having his work accepted in magazines such as Life, Sport, Playboy, Glamour, and the Saturday Evening Post. That early success uh, encouraged him to continue in the field of print journalism, and he began documenting stories across the globe um, for uh, magazines such as Life, Look, Newsweek, Time, uh, Paris Match, uh, Der Stern, and the London Sunday Times. His subjects included notable uh, individuals such as Robert F. Kennedy, Richard Nixon, Betty Davis, Barbara Streisand, Marilyn Monroe, and Muhammad Ali. Uh, and it was in November of 1963, while on assignment for the Saturday Evening of Post, that he arrived in Dallas in time to photograph Lee Harvey Oswald. Later, he actually landed Jack Ruby's final interview. But still photography is one aspect of Larry's very long and rich career. Uh, he also uh, did a number of motion pictures. Um, he was uh, directed a portion of uh, the movie Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 1969 with Paul Newman and Re Robert Redford. Uh, he also directed, uh, in part, Lady Sings the Blues uh, with Diana Ross. Um, he was uh, responsible for the Oscar-winning documentary, The Man Who Skied Down Everest in 1972. Uh, and he was the mover behind the TV miniseries, Peter the Great, uh, which won five Emmys. Uh, another aspect of Larry's career is his 35-year collaboration with Norman Mailer. Uh, he worked with Norman on the books Marilyn in 1973, Oswald's Tale, in 1995 um, and did extensive work, uh, the interviews, the research, uh, as well as um, getting an exclusive access to the book subject, uh, Gary Gilmore, for the Executioner song in 1979. And he went on to produce and direct the award-winning TV miniseries based on that book, uh, which starred Tommy Lee Jones. Uh, because he had spare time, uh, <laughs> he somehow became part of the so-called dream team defending O.J. Simpson, uh, and co-wrote the New York Times best-selling American tragedy, The Uncensored Story of the Simpson Defense in 1996. In total, Larry has produced 17 books, including uh, Perfect Murder, Perfect Town, The Uncensored Story of the John Bonet Murder, and The Grand Jury Search for the Final Truth in 1999, uh, The Cape May Courthouse, uh, Into the Mirror, and Marilyn and Me in 2012. In 2005, Larry traveled to China um, and over the course of two years built a collection of Chinese contemporary art, which numbers more than 80 paintings and photographs. In 2007, he showed his own photographs for the first time in the US at the exhibition Marilyn Monroe and America in the 1960s. In 2017, uh, he was the curator responsible for the exhibition we have on view today, American Visionary, uh, which was uh, uh, 
scheduled to come out on the 100th anniversary of the birth of John F. Kennedy and opened at the Smithsonian. In 2018, the following year, he curated another exhibition, Robert Kennedy uh, and Martin Luther King Jr., which opened at the New York Historical Society. And he's currently uh, at work on another exhibition on the life of Ray Bradbury. Join me in welcoming Larry Schiller. Thank, thank you very much for coming here. I usually start uh, a little talk like this one way, but a very nice young lady standing next to me made a comment which brought something up inside of me which at the surface wasn't very nice. And then I thought it through. And I felt that I had to start this speech by challenging everybody here in this audience, which is completely extemporaneous. The nice young lady said, aren't you surprised at this big crowd in this auditorium? And I said, of course I am. But you see, there's something wrong with this big crowd. So I'm going to tell you something that I started to do with large crowds a number of years ago. For a period of five or six years, I refused to give a talk unless every grandparent brought a grandchild to the talk. <laughs> and at the Bowers Museum and at seven other museums that I've spoken at, following a plan, they lay out a program once a month, no parents, a grandparent had to bring a grandchild to ex enter the museum, and they would have a cultural, a local artist that might watercolor and teach the grandchildren. They might have a poet like Mia Alexander, a pianist, maybe even a teacher from a school. But it started a dialogue between the grandparents and their children. So I don't mean to be impolite to my hosts, but every day is a new beginning and each day brings a little more wisdom. Uh, so think about starting a program at this museum, which you could call once a month or every two months, Grandparents' Day. You can only get in the museum if you're a grandparent and you have a grandchild with you. Thank you for bringing that to my memory. Well, This was an image that the world saw of Walter Cronkite around 12-something Dallas time on November 22nd, announcing to the world that John F. K., John F. Kennedy had been shot. In fact, six minutes before, NBC actually made the first announcement on radio. Uh, and I was in Southern California taking a shower not far from from the airport, about 16 minutes, 11 minutes from the airport. And my wife rushed in, opened the shower door, and said, JFK's been shot in Dallas. I didn't say a word to her, I didn't even towel off. I grabbed my camera bag, I threw on a pair of slacks and a shirt. I got in the car, drove to LAX airport. See, LAX was the closest news hub to Dallas in those days. Chicago was too far away. There was nothing in Miami. Atlanta didn't exist as a news hub. CNN hadn't started. New York was too far away. And San Francisco was too far away. So we were all there. All the media was there. And Southwest Airlines and American Airlines were smart enough to cancel two flights and give those planes to the media and en route to Dallas the pilot came on and said, uh, J JFK, uh, his life has been taken from us. And that's how we found out that JFK had died. Because at the airport, we just knew that he'd been shot. We didn't even know that Governor Connolly had been shot. So by the time we got to Dallas, there were updates on the plane. And Everybody knew that you, you go to the Dallas police station, the second or third floor, because that's where 
if they capture somebody, that's where he's going to be brought. And we never heard of the name at that point, Lee Harvey Oswald. Who knew who Captain Fritz was or anybody? So with my three Leica cameras, I went to the third floor and it was crowded. And of course, nobody realized at that moment, but that was the first moment in the United States that live television coverage existed. CBS had a camera at the end of the hallway. And up to that moment, there had never been live coverage of news. It was always 16 millimeter film developed. And we didn't have beta cameras even for a number of years. And as I walked down the hall with my cameras looking around in my short sleeve, you have to remember I came from California. I threw on a shirt, it was hot there, you know. And all of a sudden the elevator door opened and there I was and Lee Harvey Oswald appeared for the very, very first time in front of anybody. And I didn't realize at that moment, but it wasn't long before something hit me, which was just very, very emotional. You see, even though I'm only 26 years old at that point, I'd already traveled all around the world, maybe been to 16 countries as a photojournalist. But it was the first time that I ever saw somebody that you might say is evil that was not the age of Hitler or Mussolini or some world tyrant. I always thought of bad people as mature people, old people. And here was Lee Harvey Oswald, two years younger than me. You know, that kind of hit me much later in the day. And this is one of the iconic pictures that I made. And a couple hours later, they brought out the man, the Carcana gun. And if you look at this 16 millimeter movie footage taken by newsreel, you see all the press getting in front of it. And I, with my like, is just very quietly walking around behind it. Because if you're going to be a good photojournalist in the age of photo, golden age of photojournalism, you have to understand lighting, you had to understand composition, and you had to use your camera like the tip of a paintbrush. You had to overcome the technical aspects of it. So, as we'll see, my involvement with the Kennedys continue and actually start before this event because in 1959, 1960, Paris Match, the French magazine that hired me a lot because I lived in LA where there were movie stars and I, they didn't have a photographer who photographed movie stars, so I, I, I photographed movie stars. They hired me to photograph another movie star by the name of Peter Lawford who had just married a few years earlier, one of the Kennedy's daughters. So I went out to Malibu and he was playing backgammon on the beach with Bobby Kennedy. And that's how I met Bobby Kennedy in early 1960. And they said if I didn't take too many pictures or bother the guests, I could stay that evening and shoot some candidates of a little reception they were going to have for the magazine. And standing in the corner that night, Arthur Schlesinger was in a very, very deep conversation with a blonde who was very, very intelligent and it just shocked me. Of course, her name was Marilyn Monroe. You know, she was the dumb blonde in Seven Year Rich, but get her in a conversation about Abraham Lincoln or politics, you know, and talk to her about business, she knew what it was all about. Uh, so I eventually became Bobby Kennedy's photographer on the last campaign, Ed Guthman hired me. As you'll see later, some of my pictures of Bobby. I went on in photojournalism, as you heard, and this and that. And 
after we get ourselves into this century we're in, you know, uh, a lot of people start coming to me to be consultants or advisors. So I start doing projects. I'm, you know, not running around the world anymore producing or making films. And I've already had, and I'm not saying this negatively, five wives and five kids and five grandchildren. <laughs> and all the wives, except my one who passed on, get together on Hanukkah or Thanksgiving. And they even stay over in my house in Pennsylvania. I mean, the kids all grew up together and so forth. And, and uh, the short and long of it is that I kept my relationship with the Kennedys on and off, you know, acquaintances. And one day I get a phone call in 2015 or 16 from John Taylor Williams in Boston, the, the attorney that represents part of the Kennedys and Gene Kennedy's family and Stephen Kennedy Smith. Gene Kennedy is the only surviving sibling of JFK at this point. And she says, the centennial of my brother is coming up and you published a book with Norman Mailer called Superman Comes to the Supermarket with photographs. It was originally an Esquire piece, and if you folks have a little background in art publishing, it was published by Toshin Book Publishers. And I said yes, and she says, well, we think that's like the best photographic book that we've seen. We've got a book that we want to publish of Jack of speeches, and maybe you can add a couple pictures to the speeches. So they sent me the manuscript, and I met with Gene Kennedy in New York and Stephen, and I looked at it, and I said, this is a pretty dull, boring book. <laughs> I said, you're going to be lucky to sell 5,000 copies. You know, I'm known for making a lot of enemies that way. <laughs> well, what would you do? And I thumbed through the manuscript. I said, oh, look, here's a great speech on the environment. Why doesn't Bob Redford write 250 words about this speech? Oh, here's another speech about immigration. Why don't we get Koki Oman to write 250 or 400 words? You know, here's this. Why don't we get Senator McCain to write something about this. And all of a sudden, you see the book now becomes contemporary. It's no longer history. Because you're, you're integrating today's thought process of opinion makers or those that you respect. And then laying out the book becomes like nothing. I mean, we already had a database of 43,000 photographs of the Kennedy families by over 200 and some odd photographers, because we'll get into the golden age. of But I had to come up with an image that would speak to today's audience. Now, that's the job of a producer. Whether you're producing a motion picture, a Broadway play, or doing the opening night for the Kennedys. You have to come up with an idea. And then as Otto Preminger said to me in the 50s in Ishpeming and Marquette, Michigan, on Anatomy of a Murder, don't ever be afraid to surround yourself with talented people. You can only win that way. And I remember that. I was 16 years old when he said that to me. So I hired an art director, and we sat down, and we knew something that the public didn't know or most of the public didn't know. JFK's campaign were not run by campaign managers. They were run by advertising agencies. His father hired the biggest and the best advertising agencies to run his campaigns for senator and eventually for the president of the United States. So we started to look at these advertising agencies' campaigns for other products to see how they thought. There are books that you know, have all these ads in them. And we found this incredible ad of a perfume bottle 
with three colors. And I turned to Josh, or Josh turned to me, I don't remember. I'll give him all the credit. Let's just replace the perfume bottle with JFK. <laughs> you see? Now, we have an image that speaks to today's audience. You've got the Madman series on TV. You have contemporary design. Even though this is you know, what's almost 70 years old, it is contemporary in feeling. And when you can find an image, and I'm struggling right now with Ray Bradbury because the Bradbury estate wants me to do the centennial for Ray Bradbury in 2020, and I'm, I'm working hard with art directors to come up with an image. You know. Ah. Uh, so we're working on this book, and we're laying out the pictures. And I say to Stephen, I said, Stephen, why aren't we doing a, an exhibit? Why are we doing all this work just not to have an exhibit? I said, well, we've got to put this in the Smithsonian or someplace. And he says, well, you know, they work two years in advance. I said, yeah, but they're not going to turn down a phone call from your mother or from Caroline, are they? <laughs> they might still turn down the exhibit, but at least we're going to get ourselves. And I walked into the Smithsonian with this image on a big poster five and a half months before the date, May 2017, to open the exhibit. And they said to me, well, if you can make certain target dates, we'll gamble with you. If you miss a target date by one hour, forget it. You know, well, I was used to making Thursday night at 11 o'clock at night at Life Magazine to make sure that we were on the newsstands every Monday morning. So, you know, that didn't scare me. So in 43,000 pictures, you have to remember that at this point, I'm 23 years old when this picture is taken. No, excuse me, when this one, oh, I gotta go back. When this one, these are taken. 1920 and, and JFK's traveling and so forth. At the tame, same time he's taking it, there I am at the LA County Fair selling film. <laughs> and my mother didn't want me to be alone at the county fair, oh. so she sent my grandmother to sit there in the chair. <laughs> you see? Because this comes from what I told you about my father's salesmanship. So JFK, at the same time, you know, finds this charming young lady. This picture of her is from one of those strips that you have, in, you know. And if they get married and they have a child. At the same time, I start to chase what I call antisocial behavior. What does that really mean, antisocial behavior? How did I get involved in antisocial behavior? Well, you see, that car behind, believe it or not, in those days only cost $6,000. And my father said to me, if you can earn with the camera half the amount of money of that car, I'll pay the other half. Of course, that's what I said to every one of my children, you earn enough money to pay for half of your college, I'll pay for the other half. And what did I do? I started to chase automobile accidents. And by the time I would get there, the police were gone, the ambulance had taken somebody away. But what do you think was left? Skid marks. And I started to photograph skid marks and what did I do with the pictures? I sold them to insurance companies because they tell the story of how fast a car was going, where the place of impact was. And that's how I started to earn money with photography. I also didn't realize at that young age that I was learning about lighting. Back lighting, a skid mark looks differently. A side lighting, it looks different. At night, it looks different. Incandescent lights, it looks different. So while I'm, you know, photographing skid marks and dreaming 
well, I'm going to be photographing girls soon, you know. <laughs> Every young photographer has got to be photographing girls. I didn't realize that JFK's father was pounding into his head at the same time, you can win this election if you can get the women to vote for you. And event after event, all through the East Coast were all women. Look at this picture. This again came from the demographics of advertising, you see. While I'm at Pepperdine College, I photograph the governor, Goodwin J. Knight, it becomes his official portrait. At the same time, JFK is, is senator. I'm starting to shoot sports. And of course, in college, I couldn't read and I couldn't write very well because I didn't know until I was 50 years old that I was highly dyslexic, you see. And I didn't even want to go to class. At Pepperdine, they made me go to Bible class, I got to tell you that. <laughs> but I would sneak out of school on a Thursday night and go cover sports somewhere for Sport Magazine on a Saturday, Sports Illustrated on a Sunday, and travel back Sunday night or Monday and go to class Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. But I studied, what I did study in college was accounting and composition and things like that because I understood that I was starting to make money and I didn't even know what double entry bookkeeping was at that point, you know? But to show you how, as a photographer, you have to have anticipation and you have to understand composition I started making pictures like this that started winning small awards. And just like you have to have the real an anticipation and the composition to do this, JFK was throwing Caroline up in the air at the same time, and I wound up throwing my daughter Suzanne up in the air all the time, like driving my wife crazy when I saw this picture being published. <laughs> if he can do it, I can do it, you know. <laughs> He was on the road with his wife, traveling. At the same time, I was shooting my first Playmate for Playboy magazine. And where did I shoot it? In President Tyner's basement on campus. <laughs> the school let me do it, you know. They didn't know it was a Playmate, but they let me use the studio. Uh, so, like every young photographer, my first story for Life magazine was black and white, but my first color photograph published in Life in 1959 is this of Julie Newmar. And of course, everybody looks at it today and say, oh, with Photoshop and Adobe, this is really it. But for years, people couldn't figure out how you take a picture like this. Well, you see, in those days, being a photojournalist in the age of photojournalism, you had to really understand what the camera saw and you had to understand how to create pictures. Uh, this has a horizon line on the bottom. Boom. She's standing on the floor. But how do you know that floor is not 12 feet off the ground on the top of a scaffolding? And how do you know my camera is not 13 feet off the ground on another scaffolding? And how do you know there aren't four trampolines behind these scaffoldings with ladders that people are jumping off of and on and hitting the trampolines and we're practicing and then I took a metronome, tick tock, tick tock. And everybody, we'd practice and, and that's in those days how you came up with pictures like this that were really something for life. That's kind of what I looked like when I went on the Colorado River before as Kennedy is running for office and, you know, getting right in there. Kennedy decides to become president, goes on the road, and, and you know, Robert was known as the ruthless member of the family. He wasn't liked by anybody. He had learned everything from Roy Cohn from the McCarthy era. You know, the transition and transformation of Bobby Kennedy in life is really remarkable compared to 
JFK because Bobby does a complete flip by the time you get to the, the mid 60s. But he knew how to run a campaign. And, and the Kennedys never cared about where you photograph them, how you photograph them. They understood that they had to look human. They understood they had to look like everybody else. And uh, we get, you know, to election time in LA. You know, I'm still living in LA at that time, you know. And the election, he's nominated. And these are some wonderful pictures taken by some photographers, friends of mine. So at the same time, he's running in 1960 for president. Do you think I gave up on that blonde that I met at Peter Lawford's house? <laughs> no, no, when she did a movie with Eve Montan, I made sure that I covered it. And, you know, this is the very first picture I ever made of Marilyn. Actually, it's a very interesting little short story, is I photographed her from the door of her dressing room in the mirror, and she saw me in the mirror, and she said, Larry, you're never gonna get a good picture about me. You go sit over in that corner, and I'll look over my shoulder, and you'll get a good picture. And I went over there very sheepishly and lifted my Nikon with my 105 lens. And she turned, and I only have one frame, and that's it. She knew more about photography and lighting at that point than I did in my life. Sophia Loren. And what happens here covering Perry Match, Perry Match calls me in the middle of the night. Larry, we're pulling you off as celebrities. You've got to go photograph the next president of the United States. Three months, day and night, seven days a week. You can hire somebody just to carry your bags. We want you day and night, day and night. All of Europe is sure he's going to win. So I'm on the road. I'm traveling. I'm on the same floor as him. The Secret Service still keeps me away, you know. It's not so heavy as today. And we come election night, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm on the sixth floor. You see, I'm not on the Cape. I've been photographing Richard Nixon for four months. Because all of Europe thought that Nixon was going to win this election, hands down. And as he walks out to the podium at the Ambassador Hotel, I make this iconic picture of the tear dropping from Pat's eye, which wins Picture of the Year award. So I never photographed JFK winning the election. I was sure I was going to be with the guy who did win the election. <laughs> but the election was very, very funny. You know, we're all faced with the Electoral College. So this is Henri Dumont's picture, a friend of mine, taken at 11 o'clock in the morning, Eastern Standard Time. And you know that Nixon was still ahead on the electrical vote when this newspaper came out. But do you think the Boston Globe would give up? No way. <laughs> By one in the afternoon, finally, finally, the electoral votes moved over. So in this wonderful exhibit, we are faced with Kennedy's first 100 days, like we look at every president's 100 days, you know? And we had the Bay of Pigs. We had, you know, other events that followed, as you'll see in a few minutes. So it wasn't an easy road for anybody. But, you know, I, I, I'm there with Nixon. I'm thought of as the Nixon photographer. So what do I have to do is I have to turn to photographing Marilyn again. <laughs> but while I'm photographing Marilyn, JFK is always at Peter Lawford's house on the beach. <laughs> you see? Of course, Bobby's with him too. And these are some of my iconic images. And then in 62, one day I'm at Marilyn's house, and I'm not exaggerating, Ed Guthman is just driven Bobby Kennedy over for the afternoon. And Marilyn says, you know, in the script for Something's Gotta Give, 
there's a scene where I jump in the swimming pool and Dean Martin is up there and I'm supposed to be, you know, tantalizing him a little bit. What would happen, Larry? Because I'm really mad at Skurus and Fox. They're giving Liz Taylor, these are her words, a million dollars for Cleopatra and I'm only getting 125,000 for this movie. And I'm working the same amount of days. What would happen if I jumped in the swimming pool with my bathing suit on but came out with nothing on? And I was, you know, I'm still a little cocky, but I was really cocky in those days. <laughs> and I said, Marilyn, but you got yourself a big problem. What's the problem? You're already famous. Now you're going to make me famous. And she looked at me and said, don't be so cocky, Larry. I can fire you in two seconds. Those were her words. Of course, she didn't fire me. And I made this iconic image, which you may remember in Life magazine. The one on the left is the first Life cover I did of her. And the one on the right is when she passed on two months later. One of my pictures was also chosen for the Life cover. JFK, you know, led us into the era of the space race with Sputnik, you know, being thrown in our face. And I get another assignment from Perry Match. Oh, you got to show us what the space race is really about. Well, I didn't know anything about the space race at that time. Eventually, I fly T-Birds and, and with the X-15 and things like that. So I asked NASA for some models, and I take it to the beach, and I... I make this picture, which runs double page in all the magazines, trying to get a little humor into the story. You know, what is it going to be all about? But now as they start building the B-1 bomber, because Sputnik, you know, opened up another door, is the satellites going to be able to carry atomic weapons? And are the atomic weapons going to be able to be deployed from space? So America starts in the big race to build the bombers that can carry atomic weapons. And of course, you're not allowed to photograph any of those planes. But we know where all they are. They're at Edwards Air Force Base or McDonnell Douglas. They're all over here. So I sneak out one day, and I, you know, I have credentials. And I swear to myself, I'm not going to photograph the plane. But I photograph the shadow of the plane. <laughs> And publish it, you know. It wasn't as crazy as I thought it was going to be. I thought they were really going to get mad at me. I think they kind of liked the picture. Because the shadow distorts it. You really don't know what the plane looks like. It doesn't have that big a nose on it. At the same time, JFK is traveling around the world. And a lot of you know that he <coughs> existed with the back brace. But you never saw a picture of him climbing the stairs to a plane, you always saw him coming down because on the left, you see, he was always lifted by a forklift. And this is one of the other pictures in the exhibit that uh, uh, tells you really what it's about. And of course, his greatest ambassador overseas, as he said in France, you know, that he came with Jackie, was Jackie and McDonald and Schlesinger and some of them say that Jackie did more work on Khrushchev than JFK did, you know? At the same time that he's in France, in Austria with Khrushchev, I'm actually a thousand feet below the ocean off of Catalina, California in a diving bell in which they're testing new gases to see whether you can hook on to a submarine and bring people out when a submarine becomes unmobile. And five of us went down, and three of us came back alive. Uh, Hans Keller, uh, Peter Small was lost, and Chris Whitaker. At the same time, a friend of mine, Jacques Lowe, is photographing JFK. JFK goes to Berlin. We, we remember that great speech with Willy Brandt and Adenauer. And then coming back into the country, we come full circle into Dealey Plaza. And one of the things that confronted me about the exhibit was how do I end the exhibit? 
I don't want to show Oswald. I don't want to show the gun. I don't want to show any of that. So I, I decided to show it only from a distance, not from close up. So that's why I picked this image. But the next image was more important to me because every city in the United States had almost the same thing as the next image. Whether it was Fifth Avenue in New York, Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills, or Toledo, Ohio, or I'm sure right here in Cedar Rapids, pictures were put in store windows with JFK. And this to me is really you know, how you say goodbye to somebody that was an inspiration to many, many people. I went on to photograph, this is from my collection in the Museum of Modern Art, Buster Keaton. I started putting cameras in places that you shouldn't be putting cameras. <laughs> and then I would convince people in the PR department of the Marines at Camp Pendleton, well, you know, just let me have about eight or 10 guys. I got to do a fashion story. I don't know anything about fashion, which I don't. So when this picture was published, it was a big argument on the, on the floor of the United States Congress. I'm not kidding. My name is in the record. They wanted to know who appropriated these Marines. Is this what we're doing? And then there's Alfred Hitchcock and Tippi Hedren. <coughs> so everybody says to me, how do you make this picture, Larry? You know, were you riding with a bicycle down the freeway? Did you have a motorcycle with a sidecar? Again, it's just like the Julie Newmar. You have to think these things through. So how do you carry plate glass when you have to replace a big window? It's a suction cup, right? So I put a suction cup on the side of the car and made a little bracket to hold the camera. And I ran the wire over to the passenger seat where I am, and you know, because her body is hiding me. And I said to Hitch, I said, Hitch, if you see the camera, and he didn't let me finish the sentence, he says, oh, I know enough about it. If I see the camera lens, the camera lens will see me. <laughs> of course, he's one of the great directors. I was insulting him by <laughs> telling him what he had to do. Because he'd thought it through probably 10 times as he saw me setting it up. But what did I miss in my life of photojournalism before I, I, I am really upset. I never did cover civil rights, quite honestly. A friend of mine, Steve Shapiro, I published a book recently with James Baldwin's Fire Next Time. Uh, a very good friend of mine who covered it, Bob Alderman. And I was still putting cameras where you shouldn't be putting cameras. And then it's, you know, 65, we have the Watts riots. And that's when I do meet Dr. Martin Luther King. And I didn't photograph him a lot, but a little bit. And just to show you in the next image how a picture on the left becomes a cover of a magazine and takes on a whole different meaning, you know? You look at the picture on the left, oh, well, you know, what is that about? But the minute you do it on the right, you know? Uh, I started with Muhammad Ali the same year in 65 and followed him all the way through 76 for the thriller in Manila. But in 66, I saw the indiscriminate use of a drug called LSD. And I went to Life to do the essay and Life wouldn't give me the assignment. You know, and I, they didn't, it's a local thing, it's not national, Larry, don't worry about it. So I went over to Time Magazine and I convinced them to do a medical story on it. And then I took the medical story when Time published it and walked back into Dick Stolley's office and said, you see, if Time's writing about it, why aren't we doing it? <laughs> uh, so they gave me the assignment. <laughs> And based on this big essay that I did, I actually spent six months on it, uh, the laws in the United States were changed against the use of these drugs. And 
Tom Wolf, a very good friend of mine, was inspired by my essay as he writes in his book and wrote his first big book, Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. At the same time, my brother, who was a tennis player, was going to SC, and he told me, there's a football player here, Larry, you've got to photograph. He's going to break all the records. So I make this iconic picture of O.J. Simpson at SC against UCLA. At the same time, Bobby is out there campaigning. So I'm running between assignments and on the road with Bobby. And he's now running for the President of the United States under the shadow of his brother. And in the middle of that campaign, we lose Dr. King. You know, if I say to you America was the wild, wild west of the 60s, and we had five assassinations, I don't think many of you can tell me what the five assassinations were in the 60s. Yeah, we know JFK. We know Dr. <laughs> King. We know Bobby Kennedy. But what about Malcolm X? And what about Megar Evers? You see, we were into Vietnam. We were dropping acid. We were at Woodstock. We were the wild, wild west. And I was with Bobby when he flies to Indianapolis to give his probably his most famous speech announcing the death of Dr. King. And then up into Oregon and down into California. See, in those days, if I traveled and I had to sleep on the plane, I would just buy three tourist seats, take the cushions, and put them on the floor. <coughs> they allowed you to do that. And it didn't matter who you are. Here's Bobby sleeping with his cocker spaniel. But you can't do that nowadays, you know. And into California, and, and then I make this iconic image of Bobby three hours before his life is taken. And this is by Bill Epridge, a very fine photographer. And the train ride from New York City to Washington, D.C. But, you know, Nixon hasn't left me yet. You see, in 62, he ran for governor of California and lost to Edmund Brown, and I covered him. That's when he started to take his coat, throw his coat away, and, and campaign in shirt sleeves. The Marines were out there getting ready for big deployments to Vietnam. You see, because this was the years of golden age of journalism. Life magazine, National Geographic, they brought us these visual images. Television didn't bring it yet. Only with the Vietnam War did we start to see 16 millimeter footage. I had photographed Paul Newman on five movies. And one day when we were playing ping pong, I said, Paul, it's getting different heads on the same bodies for me. I don't know what I'm going to do. He says, well, you got to start to make pictures, Larry. He says, read the script. Tell me what's wrong. I'll find a scene for you to direct. So I read the script. And I saw that there was, in my opinion, a problem between going from the West to Bolivia. So I conceived of this whole concept of the New York sequence, which Paul allowed me to direct. It cost them about a quarter of a million dollars. And it gave me my break. And I made this famous image, as you may remember, the shootout. But then I met Barry Gordy on an assignment about him being a businessman, nothing to do with music, because he had computers in the basement of his place in Detroit. And the New York Times had sent me to photograph him and his computers. He had punch card, IBM punch card computers. And he introduced me to Diana Ross. And Diana Ross one day says, you know, there's a little music group that I'm going to sponsor. Come out to California. Would you photograph them for me? So I started to make <laughs> images. And this is the first real image. And even put aside Michael's problems as a young man, but he was still, even at that age, the Pied Piper of the family. The irony of this whole story 
is they moved to Encino, California, where I lived, three blocks away from my house, and the children of Michael's brothers here went to school with my children. And I'll tell you a real quick war story is when my mother turned 75, we decided to have a woman's only party for my mother because my mother loved to swim in the swimming pool. So it was a women's own party. And I don't know, but Michael's secretary calls me one day and says, uh, we know your mother's party is women, but Michael would like to bring a present for your mother. Do you mind if he stops by? You know, I can't say no. Like if Caroline Kennedy called one of those writers for the book, they weren't going to say no. So about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, Michael comes and he says, I brought a present. We were all out by the swimming pool for your mother. And what does he do? He brings in a young female tiger to swim in the pool with my mother. <laughs> And we actually have pictures, I didn't put it in here, I forgot, of my mother swimming with the tiger in the pool. And Michael disappeared. That was, you know, his craziness. James Earl Jones, Barbara Streisand. Of course, Jason always had the best fun. Then I started to leave photojournalism and make documentary films. And I made this film, which won the Oscar. And then on the 10th anniversary of Marilyn's death, I decided to bring together all 24, 25 photographers that had photographed Marilyn in her life into a book. And without telling you the, the whole long story, I get a phone call from Grosson and Dunlap, who had heard about the book. And they said, you know, we, we understand Random House is not going to publish it. We'd like consider it. I said, well, I've never heard of Grosset and Dunlap. What do you publish? I'd heard Simon & Schuster, Random House. Oh, we published Nancy Drew and the Hardy Boys. <laughs> but we want to break out of that mold. So I go over there and I see Harold Roth. And I said, well, Random House and I didn't get together because I didn't like the writer they wanted. And they said, who do you want? And quite honestly, as I've said before, I had never thought of it until that second. And I just looked at Harold Roth. I said, go get me Gloria Steinan and get me Norman Mailer. <laughs> I had never read Norman Mailer, OK? And Gloria I'd heard about. So Mailer writes the text for the book. And we get the cover of Life. We get the cover of Time. We get the Atlantic cover, we, like 14, 15 magazines all in the same 60 days. This cover of Time magazine I actually designed with an art director. The guy originally that Marilyn's playing with is Yves Montan. I took him out, put Norman in. And even though Norman and I went on to do four more books after this, he called me up screaming and he says, now I'm never going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. <laughs> Patty Hearst was a short time after, and I covered that and I did the exclusive interview. And I have a saying that over the years, I don't know if I was ever in a prison how to break out of a prison, but I can teach you all how to break into a prison. And of course, when I read about this horrific story in Utah where this con had attempted to commit suicide and convince his girlfriend to commit suicide at the same time. Well, that's a news story, but third, third paragraph in that story is what blew my mind, and that was that she was found with her two children under two years of age at the foot of her bed crying, and one of them was deep in their own body waste. And I said, what type of evil man could convince another human being to do that? So I went to Utah, and I spent a year and a half, interviewed over 150 people, witnessed 
Gilmore's execution, interviewed him in prison, unknown to the prison guards, or no, the warden, guards knew. Held the press conference after and announced to the world those words which became synonymous, let's do it. And you see me up in the left-hand corner. And then I asked my friend to write the book because I had remembered that he had gone through a very violent period in his life where he had a knee-jerk reaction and had stabbed his wife twice in the chest and had committed, been committed to Bellevue. So I hired Norman Mailer to write the executioner song because he understood a certain aspect of violence that he himself had been involved in. And he had the intellect and everything. And of course, we were very fortunate. The book won the Pulitzer Prize. And I produced and directed the Emmy Award winning film. And at that point, they allowed me to do anything for television, quite honestly. So in those days, we had what was known as the Book of the Month Club, you may remember. And they even had a pa paperback version of the Book of the Month Club. So I was thumbing through it one day, because you know I peruse, I can't read. And I saw this beginning of the chapter that Peter the Great had asked the boyars to terminate the life of his son so he could preserve his dream of opening Russia to the West, because the son wanted to take Russia back into the Eastern Orthodox Church. And I said to myself, wow, you know, America knows nothing. We, we just had the film Roots on television, but we don't know anything about the Soviet <clears throat> Union. We just, what we read in the paper. So what did I do as I went and I asked to see Armin Hammer in London. I asked his advice because he was in his early days, he was making pencils in the Soviet Union with, uh, that's how he got in business. So I made this eight hour miniseries with Max Schell, Vanessa Redgrave, Lawrence Olivier. And in the late 80s, I spent three and a half years there. I learned all, met everybody in internal security, GRU, KGB. But then in the 90s, this guy comes back into my life. What nobody knew is that his closest friend, Robert Kardashian, and I had been in business for about four years together. We had rented the time between movies and theaters, and we played music there, and the music companies paid us the money to play the music there. And what we had to sell was that in a city like LA, we knew what type of music to play in Watts and Beverly Hills and in the Valley. So the demographics, we understood how to split up the music. So I was able to get the exclusivity of inside the defense of O.J. Simpson. And, you know, he's guilty. There's no question the blood evidence tells you that. There's so much blood evidence. but. The cops are guilty of the fact that they falsified other evidence to convict a guilty man, you know. And after this case, you know, finished, 187 other cases in LA were thrown out of court and murderers were put back on the street because under Gates, hundreds and hundreds of criminals that were guilty of the crimes were convicted with falsified evidence. You know, but O.J.'s in his own jail, and this again is a favorite picture of mine. I wrote the number one New York Times best-selling book with James Woolworth. He wrote what took place in the courtroom. I took what, wrote what took place in the defense meetings. And then Norman w was getting on in years, and he was teaching me to write. 5,000 words in a thesaurus is what he said to me when we were in Belarus doing Oswald's Tale. But because of our relationships with the KGB and Tchaikovsky and everybody in the Soviet Union, when Robert Hansen was caught, the American who was a Russian spy for 30 some odd years, we had complete access through the so Russian side, Soviet side, to their side of the story. And we not only did the book, but did the film with William Hurt 
But what very few people know about is that I used all the real KGB guys playing themselves in the film. The man on the left in the tan shirt is the number one guy in the KGB. <laughs> and the other guy is the one that was in charge of all of North America, the KGB. And because they loved Peter the Great, I had asked Gorbachev once, what did you think of the film? And it was very interesting. He said, well, there's nothing in it that I'm ashamed of. That was his answer, a nice political answer, you know. What do I do now besides exhibitions? I take journalism from the second half of the 20th century and I put it together with photography of the second half of the 20th century and I publish books. Frank Sinatra has a cold with my friend Gay Talese and Phil Stern. Tom Wolfe and I, Electric Kool Aid, as I mentioned, James Baldwin, Steve Shapiro. And then, as, as I told you, the, I had done this book, Superman Comes to the Supermarket, on the left, and Kennedy's came to me to do the book. And out of the book, you know, why are we doing a book and not exhibit? We opened in the Smithsonian. This was a radical change for the Smithsonian <laughs> American Art Museum to have something like that on the wall rather than these beautiful oil paintings, you know? But they had, they had the courage to do it, and I thank them. This was opening night. I produced the show for Stephen and Caroline Kennedy with a lot of guests and Nancy Pelosi, various people. And then last year, as was mentioned, I did Bobby Kennedy and Martin Luther King, The Promise and the Dream. I asked David Margulik to write the text. Now, you probably are all asking yourself, how do you do all of this in your life? How do you get it all done? How many people are working for you? Well, I do have a very, very big staff. And when I go out, I always take the youngest of that staff to, with me, and I ask them their ideas and this and that. And you see, the staff is my family. <laughs> you see, my kids, my grandkids, there's even a couple of my wives here. And, and uh, I actually involved them in every single, when I went to Ray Bradbury's archives in Indianapolis, I took my grandson, Ben, and, and uh, Ellery, my granddaughter, and, and when we drove back, I said, now tell me what you think. What interested you? Because if I'm going to appeal to new young readers, I want to hear it from young people. So that's what my life is, never being afraid to learn something that you know nothing about. I thank you for your patience, and I hope I haven't run too long. And please, think about Grandparents' Day. Thank you, Larry. Um, thank you all. I'm sure Larry would take a few questions, uh, uh, but it'll only have to be a few um, because there's so many of you. But uh, if somebody has a question, please. Please, don't, don't be afraid. Come on. Yes, the young lady. Pardon? You say you tackle everything. How are you doing on social media? Well, myself, I don't do anything, but for my clients, I do. Uh, you know, we're on Instagram and everything, and I'm learning it, to be very frank with you. But I have uh, uh, four young people that run, they report to me twice a week. And, uh, you know, we make mistakes and we, we learn it. But, uh, you know, the copyright laws are all, gonna, are all being rewritten now because of social media, you know, and all of that. You know, it's a very interesting case in, in the New York Times front page two days ago of all the photographs that were taken of the slaves that were sold, that Harvard says that they own and the descendants of the slaves feel that they own the pictures. It, it doesn't have to do with the intellectual property rights. The copyrights are long gone. But who owns the physical print? You see? Uh, that's an interesting situation because they're all over social media. Yes, the gentleman in the back. Yes, right there. All the way in the center. Yeah. Okay. Loud, loud, loud. All right. My dad was also a photographer at the same time you were. And I know that that equipment that you were carrying along with the, the 
batteries and everything probably weighed close to 80 pounds. Yes. My question is, he has passed. What is your take on phone cameras and watch cameras? I just, right. I've always wanted to know sure. what someone in the same field felt. Well, number one, we all have to accept evolution. Okay? You know, uh, let's just be frank about it. I went from that speed graphic to a roller cord to an exacta to Leicas, which you saw at the Kennedy things, and so forth. I only use a cell phone. I don't own a professional camera anymore. But I know how to use it. I know how to set it with the greatest latitude. I know which ASA or ISO number to keep. And I know that if you work six inches this way or two feet that way, the light will be better. When the gentleman, and I didn't mean to be rude to him, wanted to shoot me for television, I walked over and I put my fist up to see where the light was, and then I put my face where my fist was. So if you understand lighting and if you understand composition, and you really read your iPhone book or go into the internet, you can use that camera incredibly because the lenses in there are not optical, but they're almost as good as the Leica lenses of the 60s. I, for the last six years, I, I don't have a professional camera. Yes, sir. Uh, you had mentioned uh, Bobby Kennedy's kind of about face, particularly with the uh, civil rights and so on in the 60s after he got out of the Royce Bond order. Right. Uh, were you privy to any of those uh, really important meetings that he had with some of the civil rights icons of the day that really weren't reported very much? Well, number one, in the book, The Promise and the Dream, that I asked David Margulick to write, we talk about that because the civil rights people didn't trust Bobby Kennedy. Uh, Dr. King only saw him once with Lyndon Johnson. Uh, James Baldwin had to be an intermediary. They had a, a meeting several times. Bobby was not trusted by the civil rights people. Uh, the turning point with Bobby was really when he went and met Chavez of the farm unions workers up in Northern California. And he really started, I'm gonna tell you a Bobby Kennedy story, which is in the book, to show you how naive, you know, he's running for president. This is 1967, 68. And I'm gonna leave the person's name out who's driving the car. But he's driving him through Harlem. He had actually never been in and out of Harlem, okay? And a young black kid runs up to Bobby and says, give me five. And Bobby raises his hand and turns to the driver. And he says, what does he want, five dollars? What am I supposed to do? <laughs> this is a true story. You understand? This is a true story. So there was an awakening. I don't think there was ever a real civil rights awakening with Bobby. Okay? With JFK, it was political. The way we wrote the book, The Promise and the Dream, it was like two men are climbing the same mountain, but they're on opposite sides. In, in the exhibit that I did for the New York Historical Society, there's a very telling picture that when Dr. King moved to Atlanta, uh, the two Ku Klux Klan uh, burnt a cross on his lawn. And what is the picture of? Not the house and the cross, but Dr. King holding his three-year-old baby, explaining to him what the cross is all about. You see? Did any of you ever read the uh, Roman Gary Peace and Life magazine called White Dog? It's an incredible story out of the late 60s in which a dog is trained, a German shepherd, to harm and attack black people. And how they break the dog and retrain the dog, and what happens out of that situation. I'm not gonna give you the answer, but you can look it up on the internet. Read White Dog by Roman Gary, the French novelist and ambassador. No other questions? Uh, yes, sir. How did uh, Marilyn Monroe really die? 
Oh, well, the, uh, okay, so uh, I'm going to give you a foundation quick. How many of you young ladies in the audience know what pinking shears are? So you all know, right? So she would sit in her T-bird opposite uh, Schwab's with me, and I would have my color transparencies, not in frames, but, you know, rolls, we developed them. And she would hold them up to the screen, uh, street lights, and with pinking shears, she'd kill the ones she didn't like, okay? But the problem was she had walked back to the car with two bottles of Don Perignon, and she was probably on her fifth or sixth pill, okay? That was Marilyn's problem, that, you know, she had it with Bert Stern, with Milton Green, she had it on the set, Clark Gable went crazy in The Misfits. Uh, I'm not gonna get into her personal life because I spent a lot of time with her, and, you know, and I still have questions. But I believe that she just, you know, lost count. Very sadly, you know. Thank you for your patience with me.